a nod there, and I think that nod means that it's over to me. Um, I understand that for the last couple of weeks you had Lawrence Kennedy, David's brother, with you. And I think David did mention the fact that he and I were partners in crime. Now, you don't have to get the police after us. We weren't really that bad. But Lawrence and I used to sing together. We played our guitars and we sang together. And we also sang together as part of the Templemore Hall Male Voice Choir. And one of my favorite hymns, and this brother wouldn't have known it, was that last hymn that you gave out. What a day, glorious day that will be. And what a hope. Saved by the sovereign, matchless grace of God. And Ian mentioned that in his opening prayer. Last Sunday, David dropped me a wee text and he asked me if I happened to have a title or a theme for the next two Thursday nights in God's will. And I have to confess, there were a number of things still floating through my head when David wrote, and it helped focus my heart and my mind in a positive way. And here's what I want to speak about tonight. The fact that we're saved in order that we might serve. Now, very often when we present the gospel, we say, and rightly so, that you and I In our unregenerate state, we were without God, we were without Christ, and therefore, we were without hope. But then, obviously, in God's sovereign love and grace and mercy, he sent his Son to die for each one of us upon the cross. And the hymn writer has said, Upon that cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died, to take away my sin. And very often when we present the gospel, we focus, and understandably so, that salvation is sins forgiven, peace with God, condemnation removed. All of those things are true. But sometimes we forget to tell people that you've been saved in order that you might serve. Now it's also true that one day either death will overtake us and for us it will be absent from the body and at home with the Lord or the Lord will come to the air and take us to be with himself. And that's a wonderful prospect for all who know and love the Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, and I come back to my title, What am I meant to be doing? What are you meant to be doing? We're meant to be serving. We used to teach the wee boys and girls, Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light. Like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, so we must shine. Now listen to this. You in your small corner, and I, in mine. I could have read many portions of scripture, but it so happened that during lockdown, I spent a wee bit of time in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And these verses that I want to read with you this evening, um, <clears throat> they're up on the screen there for your aid. They're found in Ephesians chapter 6, the last chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, verses 5 to 9. And here's what Paul says. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And then verse 9 is a message for masters, and you masters do the same things to them. 
giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Now, as I've said in my opening remarks on this subject of being saved to serve, I could have turned to many, many portions of God's Word, and I could have taught the same truths. But what I've done is I've broken in to almost the end of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, so therefore we must look at our text in its context. Now, I'm not trying to be clever. You'll see what I mean in a minute. You see, whenever you turn to an individual verse or a section of Scripture, here are three basic things that you ought to do. Now, I may have said this in one of my previous visits, but I tend to want to always reinforce this. Always start off with the context. Where do these verses fit in with the rest of what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus? Then you look at the content. Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? What are they saying? And then the consequence is this. What does that mean to me? How am I going to live my life tomorrow differently, better, by virtue of what God has said through his servant Paul many, many years ago. You see, if you want to gain a balanced understanding of the church at Ephesus, you need to do at least three different things. In the book of Acts chapter 19 and into the beginning of chapter number 20, we read of Paul's first visit to Ephesus and the opposition that he faced and the problems that he had and the idolatry and the sinful nature of all of these people's lives. But you know, the gospel prevailed, and lives were changed, and a little assembly was established in Ephesus. Sometime later, the apostle Paul sat down with his pen and wrote a letter to those dear believers, and we'll look briefly at that in a wee moment. But there is a touch of sadness when you go to the last book of your Bible in chapters 2 and 3 where John is inspired by the Spirit of God to write the letters to the seven churches. There's a very sad note. Because he, he was able to speak about all the great things that were going on at Ephesus. But he says, I've got one thing against you. You've moved away from your first love. Can you put your mind back to when you first became a Christian and the joy of the Lord was in your heart and you wanted to share it with others and you wanted to see your family saved? Isn't it sad? And I'm first of all pointing the finger at myself. Sometimes we become very content and we miss that vision for those who are perishing all around us. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it divides neatly in two. The first three chapters are all about the possessions that we have in Christ. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms in and through and by Christ Jesus. And it's not only about our possessions in Christ, it's our position in Christ. Once afar off, But by virtue of the blood of Christ and the death of Christ, we've been brought into a near position with God. And so those first three chapters are all about our possessions in Christ and our position in Christ. But the second half of Paul's letter to Ephesians goes into a more practical dimension. Paul asks and answers this question, in light of what God has done for you and me, so what? How is our lives going to be different? How does God expect us to live? Now, it would take weeks, maybe months to develop this, but I'm only giving you a wee quick summary. And so in those chapters 4, 5, and 6, God expects us to walk in unity with other believers. You're not like me. I'm not like you, and you're probably glad you're not like me, but that's only by the way. We've been made uniquely different. 
And God has brought you all together into this fellowship. And each of you have got a different perspective, but you've got a common bond of love in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to walk in unity. He wants us to walk in love. He wants us to walk in purity. He wants us to walk as children of light. He wants us to walk, as the authorized says, circumspectly or carefully, differently. He wants us to walk in harmony. And then he wants us to walk in victory. And tonight I'm going to talk about some of these verses that sit in this little section. He wants us to walk in harmony. We're not going to look at this this evening, but in chapter 5 near the end, Paul starts this little section, walking in harmony. He talks about husbands and wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And then, of course, he talks in the opening of chapter number 6, the verses before where I started to read about children and parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Parents, don't aggravate or annoy unnecessarily your children. You see the harmony between husband and wife. The harmony between children and parents. And then the bit that I did read is the harmony between servants and masters. And so let's look first of all at the message to the servants. You see, the word servants refers in this portion of scripture to Christian slaves. In Bible times, even though we might not like it, we might abhor the thought of slavery, but slavery was an accepted norm. I googled it to discover that there was approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. It's hard even to get your head around that. You notice that Paul's message wasn't to overthrow the Roman government and change the system, but notice this, to share the gospel through godly living, and as a result, winning others for Christ. Now, although this message in chapter 6 is primarily for bond servants or slaves, I want to suggest, and hopefully you will agree with me at the end, if you don't, I'll not fall out with you, that we can apply these principles to your life and to mine. Come on a journey, and I'll show you what I mean. How should a Christian work? So verse number 5 says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Now here's a reality check. It doesn't matter what kind of job that you have. It doesn't matter what kind of work that you do. In all of it, remembering, remember that you serve Christ. Maybe you're going to say to me tonight, I'm lucky, I'm retired, I don't have a job. You mightn't have a day job. But I want to say to you that God has saved you so that you might continue to serve him. Notice what it says, show proper respect. And Paul brings out this little line there in the last wee portion of verse 5, in sincerity of heart. He's saying to these servants or slaves, don't try to take advantage of your employer. Devote full attention and energy to the job. The best way to witness, he said to them, is to work hard. But I want to bring that wee thing that is the title of this slide. As Christians, you and I ought to be obedient. Verse 5. But then in verse number 6, there's a slightly different thought that Paul brings to us. And that is this. Be consistent. Notice what he says. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. Working conscientiously and consistently. You know, working when the boss is looking 
and the boss is not there. I once had a fellow working for me when I worked for BT, and we had a number of places that we worked, and one of them was a big storeroom down in Newton Arts. And I had this sneaking suspicion that when I was there, this boy wasn't a bad worker. In fact, he was quite good. But I had this sneaking suspicion that when I wasn't there, he just took the foot off the accelerator. And one day he and I were together in the warehouse in Newton Ards, just behind Clark's funeral parlor there in Newton Ards. BT used to have a big depot in there. And I was with him in the morning and I get into my car to go back to Belfast and then I discovered I'd left my mobile phone back. And when I drove back down past Clark's, down into the big depot at the back, this fellow was lying with his shirt off on bits of hardboard and he was sunbathing. And when I arrived, he couldn't even put two words together. He went, dab, da, dab, 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 dab. He couldn't even speak. What had happened? He was happy to work well when I was watching him, keeping an eye on him. But the minute that I went out of the way, he thought to himself, I can do whatever I want. Is not a challenge for you and me. Because the God that you and I serve, he doesn't slumber or sleep. I say it reverently, he doesn't go off on holiday. He's always there. He's always watching. And I think the motivating factor here, in verse 5 it was sincerity of heart. But verse 6, the thing that makes all the difference in the way that I serve is willingness of heart. I want to do it. I want to do it out of devotion to Christ. Do a good job because it's what God wants us to do. Be obedient, verse 5. Be consistent, verse number 6. Here's another one. Be focused. With goodwill doing service. Notice this. As to the Lord, not unto men. You know, when our motivation is right, in other words, we want to do a good job to please God, our focus will be right. Our heart will be in tune with God, serving with goodwill. That word goodwill means generosity. Doing the job while devoted to the Lord. And recently I read that little verse and I was challenged by it. In fact, 2 Corinthians 9 is all about giving, at least at the beginning of that chapter. And it says there, God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because the one that ultimately we're seeking to please is God, not men. Then we're to be confident. Now, not confident in ourselves, but confident in the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. For four years, I worked for TransLink in Belfast. And part of my induction into the company, I went round the different depots and I came across a dear man who was a fellow believer working at Green Island train station. Now it's just a halt really, it's not a full train station. But here's what he said to me, I work for the Lord but TransLink pays my salary. And I love that. I work for the Lord but TransLink pays my wages. And you know that dear man over the years, he's retired now, he belongs to Carrick Baptist. Every opportunity he had with those young students getting off at Green Island to go down to the university, he would have a word with them for Christ. He wasn't a pushy man. He wasn't in your face. He had a real love for the young ones and got to know them as they got off the train got to know many of them by name 
And he just said that he, he and I were sitting in a wee hut, drinking a mug of tea, and that's what he said to me. He said, you know, David, I work for the Lord, but TransLink pays my wages. Do you know, over the years, many people have undertaken thankless jobs. Many have worked hard for very little or perhaps even no reward. This was particularly true when Paul was writing in Bible times, people who were slaves. But, you know, if our mindset is we're doing this for God, notice what it says. We can be confident that God will see to it that we're properly rewarded. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. We used to sing with the boys and girls, store your treasures in the bank of heaven, where no thief can steal them away. You will find them safely waiting for you when you get to heaven some day. But not only had Paul a message for slaves, but he also had a message for masters. And notice what he says to them. Now, if any of you were bosses, I hope you weren't like this fellow that I've put up. Not a very happy cookie. Quite angry. And he says, And you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So Paul has a similar message. You'll notice the tone of what Paul is saying. He's, this section is all about harmony, husbands and wives, children and parents, servants and masters. You might not actually own a company, but you think of it, if you ask somebody to come into your house to do a bit of work for you, they're really working for you because you're paying them. So I wonder what your attitude is and how you treat them. And I wonder if they came to do something in your house, repair something, and the way you talk to them and the way you greet them, without you telling them, could they turn around and say, I think you might be a Christian? Wouldn't that be interesting? You see, the, the, the lesson that Paul is getting across here, treat others as you like to be treated. Do the same things to them. You see, you and I demand respect, respect in return or show respect to those who work for you. You expect dedication and hard work. God would have us to be an example to others. Why? Why is Paul demanding this? And he puts it in this verse. Remember that you two are answerable to your master who is in heaven. You know, as we summarize in this practical session of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul pens out for us, underlines, emphasizes how we as Christians ought to live to live in unity. Now, Paul talks, if you're reading from the authorized text, he, he says walk. But that word walk really means live. We are to walk or we are to live in unity. We're to walk or to live in love. Walk or to live in purity. Walk or to live as children of light. Walk or to live carefully. I remember years ago when I was in drum at one of the conferences I spoke on these uh, different things and I used the example that little word carefully or circumspectly in the authorized text carries with it the thought do you ever see a cat walking along a very thin fence very carefully it picks where it's putting its paws so as to maintain the balance and keep walking in a straight line. And that's what's meant here. We're to walk carefully or differently. Differently to those that live around. We're to walk in harmony. And that's this little section that we've looked at. The tail end of it uh, in chapter number 6 verses 5 to 9. 
And God willing, next week, I'm going to move into that we are to walk in victory. And we'll see what the implications of that are. But as far as you and I saved to serve, God wants us to be obedient. In the Old Testament, we read that tremendous truth. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, sometimes, and we shouldn't do this, but sometimes we like to think of what we're giving to God. Now, we give to God because he's already given to us. But sometimes, sadly, our minds can be a little bit out of perspective and we become focused about what we're giving to God. But the Bible says that obedience is even better than sacrifice. Things that you sacrificially are prepared to give to God. And then in our lives we are to be consistent. One of the most humbling things, my wife Lynn and I, we now live in the middle of nowhere, I say. It's in the dead of country. And uh, our, my next door neighbor is about a quarter of a mile over that way. And uh, when we first moved in, this man came over to our house. He looked very thin and quite unwell. And it turned out that he had suffered from cancer of the esophagus. And he had this massive big scar. I could see it quite visibly starting away behind his ear and going right down into the middle of his shirt. And he put his hand out and he said, My name is Roy and my wife, who can't be here today, she's working. Her name is Winnie. Welcome to Burn Quarter Road. And I thought, that's lovely. But he said a strange thing to me. He says, when I go, will you read Psalm 116 verses 1 to 7? I looked at him and I said, I would be very happy to read Psalm 116 verses 1 to 7, but Roy, can you explain to me why I should read it? Here's what he told me. He said, I live most of my life without God. And I was lying in the Royal Victoria Hospital and I was only given somewhere between 20 and 25% chance of survival. And he said, I knew that I was going to meet God and I wasn't ready. And he got down the Gideon's New Testament and began to read in the Psalms, New Testament and Psalms as they used to be the Gideon's New Testament. And in Psalm 116, he found God and his life was changed. His wee wife, sadly, as yet is not a Christian, but we met her and we hadn't said anything. Now, on that day, I did do something. I put my hand out to Roy and I said, Love you to meet you, brother. And he nearly fell, because I could tell he was nervous as he tried to witness to me. But you know, one day, his wife was talking, I think it might have been to my wife, Lynn, there was some conversation, and she said, you know, you are Christians. Now, I have a wee strange thing I say if somebody ever says that to me. I never said that I was a Christian. I'm not saying that I'm not a Christian. And she said a lovely thing to my wife. You don't have to tell me you're are Christians. I've been watching you. Isn't that a queer? I've been watching you. You see, a lot of unbelievers don't read this book here. They would never take time to open it. Not saying that they're all like that. I once witnessed to a man, <clears throat> and I, with fear and trembling, he was my big boss when I worked in Dublin, and I had a Gideon Slimline New Testament I wanted him to have. And I said to him, tell me this, Mark, if I gave this to you, would you take it? He said, I would. And then I tried something else. I said to him, have you ever read the Bible? And I nearly fell off my feet when he told me the answer. He says, I've read it cover to cover seven times. And I said, what do you make of it? He says, it's a very challenging book. I said, have you found God yet? Have you found salvation? What he said, not yet. Not yet. One of the things that I learned with Mark, I think there was only, in the four years I worked with him, I think there were only maybe three times I had to witness directly to him. But the one lesson that I learned was, 
to be consistent, to be a man of my word. If I promised him I would do something, I would do it. If I failed, I would be honest and tell him that I wasn't able to do it. The Bible wants us to be obedient. It wants us to be consistent. It wants us to be focused, focused on the fact that we're serving God and not men. You know, in Matthew 6, I think it is, in the Sermon on the Mount, it actually says there, if in our giving we do it to be seen of men, that's the only reward we'll get, the well done from men, not the well done from God. But if we do it in privacy and in secret, as unto the Lord, that's where be confident comes in. That God is the one who will ultimately reward us if we are obedient, if we are consistent, if we are focused on the fact we want to serve him. That's the primary driver. When I get up in the morning, I want to please the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. I want others to come to know him and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord. And of course, be confident that if we do all of that, God will see to it that he will reward us. And then, as Christian bosses, or if we ever have anyone in our house doing some work, treat others as you'd like to be treated. Show respect to those who work for you. Be an example to others. Ultimately, remembering that you're answerable to your master who is in heaven. And so, this evening, we've had the first of two little talks on the subject. Yes, we're saved, that our sins might be forgiven, that we won't go to a lost eternity, that one day we'll ultimately be with Christ in heaven. But please, 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 never forget, you've also been saved in order that you might serve. So I trust that God will bless these thoughts to all of our hearts, and I'm going to hand over now to David.